Almost three years ago, I started building the Airfix M3 Stewart in 135th scale. I was doing this as part of a buddy build with two other YouTubers, Herbert Erpadup and Nomad Productions. It seems that they finished theirs already and I am massively behind the curve. In a previous video, I focused on the internal areas of this tank, but now it's time to turn my attention to finishing this once and for all. Hello everyone, I'm Matt and join me on the workbench today as I try and finish the Airfix M3 Stewart in 135th scale. For a deeper dive inside the contents of the box, take a look at the dedicated unboxing video I made on that topic. In this one though, I'll be focusing on the completion of the tank and rounding off the video with a review. I'll put a list of the products I used on the screen now to give you an idea of the kind of things you might want to go and get if you fancy having a go at this for yourself. Without any further ado though, let's get straight into it. Just like in the previous episode, all parts have been cut from the sprue using a knife or a side cutter and then sanded down with a sanding stick. Here I'm using Revell contactor cement to glue into place these blanking plates that go on the front of the tank. Again, just like I said in the previous episode, I don't know what every part of a tank is, so let me know in the comments if I'm close or, you know, if I get it wrong. So up next is the side plates which go onto the side of the hull and these metal protrusion parts, I guess they help to keep the tracks in place. And then at the rear of the tank, we installed these fenders. Which Following on from this, I glued into place a part which looks a bit like an exhaust or venting system and the two small components which go into the holes on either side of this. The armour panel at the rear of the tank gets glued into place here and it has the moulded on tail lights. Following on from this, I used a small drill bit, I think it was a 2mm part, to drill out the two holes on either side of the rear of the tank. This is so that I can install the nets components, which to me look like part of the engine exhaust system. So if I hadn't have opened these holes up, it would be very difficult to get the pipework that goes onto the back of the tank into the correct place. Up next is the completion of some of the fuel cans. Unlike the very recognizable jerry cans of uh, the German forces during World War II, it seems like the Allies used these rather simple cubes and they weren't really that fit for the job. So I, I have read at times that the Allies would actually commandeer the uh, German ones if they managed to get their hands on them. Some more stowage bins could be added onto the sides of the tank. And then I moved on to assembling the main gun, which comes in a surprising number of parts, but it does look fairly well detailed once you've done so. So I'm just going to whiz through this, but as you can see, there is a end of the barrel of the gun, which needs to be glued into place. And then the mounting components can be assembled together. If you do this correctly, you should have a gun which can elevate up and down quite freely. So that's what I was going for here. I wanted that functionality. Not sure I'm going to use the functionality, but it would be nice to have it as part of the completed build. Having glued this part together, it was now time to start painting. To prime the model, I decided to use this Ivory K-Colors Primer. This is an airbrush ready paint and it was simply loaded into the airbrush and applied to the entirety of the model, having masked the internal areas that I previously painted. After this, this Vallejo Ghost Grey was used to do some pre-shading. Now, bearing in mind, this is like early 2020 for me, and I've not really done much in the way of pre-shading, and this was the first time I'd really tried it out. Following on from this, this Vallejo buff will be used as the top layer of the camo scheme. So this was simply applied all over the tank and chassis and the gun. It's a little bit vibrant, but I will address that later on. After this, the gunmetal grey colour from Vallejo was thinned down with some acrylic thinners. I didn't really go for any kind of ratio here, I just wanted it to be thin enough to apply it without leaving any brush strokes. This was then carefully brushed onto the areas of the main gun that required it, and whilst I had it on the paintbrush, I decided to do the guns which are still on the sprue, and also the smaller tools which are going to be added to the tank later. 
Not sure why I bothered to do this back in 2020 at this point because I'll end up painting over them anyway. And that's as far as I got in around 2020. So fast forward about two and a half years and we are ready to continue. Because I hadn't bothered to start on the turret, that's what I did now. The little chairs need to be assembled and then the seats were painted with this khaki colour. I used this straight out of the pot, I didn't bother to thin this one down, but the seats and the little backrests were carefully painted with this colour. After this, the turret components were glued together. You need to make sure that you get the basket on the ring in the correct location because otherwise it doesn't quite fit. It has one way that it goes on and that is it. After this, I glued the seats and their supports into place. This was a little bit fiddly and it took a little bit of time, but you can get there in the end. Following on from this, the coaxial machine gun was glued onto the side of the main cannon. Then after this, I glued it into place onto the turret ring, taking care to make sure that it was still in a operable condition and I hadn't put glue in the wrong places. The top of the turret was then glued into place and so too was the front, taking care to pass it over the top of the cannon and machine gun. I then added these extra components which build up the superstructure of the top of the turret and then I glued into place the support bar which will hold the turret hatch in the open position. This small component was slid over the cannon and machine gun and then glued to the cannon and machine gun so that it can still elevate up and down. If you glue that onto the turret you'll uh, remove that functionality. Up next is the assembly of the mount for the external machine gun and then I popped the top of the turret hatch into place. This isn't glued in, I will remove it later but I'm just keeping it here for masking. I then went ahead and glued on some extra details on the side of the turret and some super glue was used to glue the towing eyes onto the winch cable. You do get some thread in the kit but uh, plot twist it isn't actually the right length and I would end up having to cut it to the correct length off camera to make sure it actually fit on the tank. Because I'd forgotten what kind of primer I used previously on the rest of the model I decided to just use this cheap grey spray primer out of a rattle can. It was sprayed onto all of the turret parts I've not yet added to the model and you can see that I masked off the bottom to make sure that those white internal areas remained white. This should give a good layer for the next layer of paint which again was the buff colour. I did manage to find that one in my stash. I did thin it down with some Humbrol acrylic thinner to make it flow through the airbrush a little bit better and I do try to replicate the pre-shading that I did on the earlier parts of the model by just spraying more of the paint in different areas. This is to try and replicate that look and make it look a little bit more uniform but it is a little bit noticeable that I didn't use the same light primer colour so this yellow isn't as vibrant as it is on the rest of the tank. However I did persevere with it and I will address the fact that it's not as light as the rest of the tank with some weathering a bit later on. Up next is this light green blue from Vallejo. I actually did a bit of research a few years ago when I first got this kit and I bought the camouflage paint colours at the time and it seemed to be suggested online that this would be an appropriate colour for the blue-green element of this paint scheme. However, I think it's a little bit too blue. I think it should have a little bit more green in it. Perhaps it's due to the fact that I've applied it onto the yellow. It doesn't look quite right. But um, yeah, I don't think it's that bad. I think it's pretty close and at the end, I actually quite like how blue it is. It does make for an interesting looking model. Um, so this paint was just thinned down with some acrylic thinner and then carefully hand painted on. I did think about using the airbrush to complete this step, but I kind of thought you needed a nice hard edge um, where the yellow and the blue meet. And this was probably the easiest and quickest way I could think of to get that done. Not to mention the fact that I'd already glued on a lot of the separate details and having to mask lots of various things would make this a very time consuming and difficult step and my painting skills are okay so I thought that I'd just crack on with it in this manner. 
Hard Rod 32, which is a very dark grey. It's not quite a black, but it, it's almost at that point. This was used on the wheels of the tank. It's a colour that I used previously on my Panzer II build, and I quite like the way this looked, so I carefully applied it to these areas. I kind of wish, just like in my Panzer II build, that I had left the wheels off and done this separately, because them being on the model made it ever so slightly more difficult but I think I managed to do a reasonable job of it despite the handicap that past me had presented to current me. With that done, this olive brown colour from Vallejo was used to carefully paint those pipework parts that I previously installed on the model. Following on from this, this airbrush ready Vallejo camouflage pale brown was loaded into the airbrush and then used for the brown splotches which go onto the sides of the tank. Having done something similar with my Panzer II, I feel like I had a little bit more confidence but I still think I need a bit more practice with my airbrushing skills. According to the painting instructions, some olive drab paint needs to be applied to the model in the areas where the registration numbers are going to go. Why they couldn't just have printed this as part of the decal, I don't know, but I decided to cut out a rectangle to the correct size using some masking tape, and then I sprayed it onto the tank in the relevant area. In preparation for the decals, I'm going to use this Vallejo gloss varnish thinned down with some water in the airbrush and it was applied to the areas where the transfers are going to go. I didn't bother applying it to the entire tank, just the relevant areas. Fortunately, there aren't that many transfers in this kit, so this was a fairly quick step. Moving on to the transfers, I did have my reservations regarding the quality of these as it's not indicated anywhere on the box that they are cartograph and they do seem a little bit thicker than normal Airfix transfers, so I believe they may come from a different manufacturer. To try and combat any issues, I used some Humbrol Decal Fix as my setting solution and it was brushed onto the areas they were going to go and then after soaking the transfers in warm water to release them from the backing paper, they were carefully slid into position in the right places. I did find that the transfers were actually surprisingly good despite the fact they may not be cartograph transfers. I didn't notice any silvering and the overall thickness wasn't a problem when they were applied to the model. Once they were all in place, a little bit more of the decal fix was brushed carefully over the top to further soften them down and settle them into the surface of the plastic. And when they had cured, this XW10 K Colors matte varnish was loaded into the airbrush and sprayed over the transfers to help settle down any of that gloss from earlier and give them a uniform finish whilst also protecting them from any weathering I might do shortly. Some Humbrol Precision Poly was then used to carefully glue on all of the tools and things which have been painted off the model. These need to be placed into their positions on the back of the tank so that the crew have ready access to them if they might need them. The machine gun that goes on the outside of the turret can now have its mount assembled. I decided to assemble the mount in such a way as it did look on the artwork on the box and that is to have it pointing up as if there's weight in the uh, back of the weapon and forcing it to point the barrel upwards into the sky. This was then carefully glued into place on the turret. The hatch at the top of the turret was glued into place onto its supporting bar in the open position. This was then followed by installing the hull machine gun from the inside in the hole on the bottom of the hull. This was a little bit fiddly and I did have to open the hole up a little bit with a drill bit off camera. The hatches on the bottom of the tank can be glued in the open position and that's something that I decided I wanted to do to try and show off the detail that was inside the tank. And it was a little bit fiddly trying to get the parts to stay in the right place whilst the glue dried. Following on from this, I then added the turret into place, ensuring that it could rotate freely, and then I popped the top of the tank onto its chassis. I won't glue them on because I may decide to do things inside the chassis later on. I know in the previous episode I thought I might use the single link tracks, but you know, in hindsight, I'm not sure I have the uh, capacity for that at the moment. So I'm going to use the rubber band tracks in this build and I decided to weather them up a bit using the gunmetal paint from previous. I would also use this on the towing eye and winch cable. 
I did ask a question in my Discord server as to what the best colour for chipping would be, and it was suggested that the olive drab might be the most appropriate. So I sponged on some of this colour paint to make it look as if it had chipped in various places. The cable was then carefully glued into place using some super glue. This was quite fiddly and it did take a little bit of work to get the cable to go around the various details of the model, but after some perseverance I did manage to get it in a position which I quite liked. This Ravel number no. 9 anthracite grey enamel paint was then thinned down with some white spirit. I'm replicating the wash that I used on my Panzer II because I quite liked the effect that gave, and this was simply painted over the entire model to bring out those recessed details and to give the effect of grime and dirt accumulation on the model. As mentioned, I'm using the rubber band tracks, and to join these together, I connected them using their molded rivet pins and then melted them using my soldering iron. The soldering iron was on its lowest heat setting, and I melted the pins until they had bonded with the other part of the rubber plastic and created a strong bond so that it wouldn't pull apart. The tracks were then carefully stretched and put into position on the side of the tank. This tank does have the functionality of having the tracks freely rotate if you build it correctly. However, I glued the front sprocket into place, so mine will be in a static position. Despite this though, I did manage to get the rubber band tracks into their correct position and they don't look too bad despite the fact that they are not the single link version. With that done, I tested the fit to see how well the top of the tank will fit onto the chassis with this in place. A final bit of weathering now is to put the pale sand through the airbrush, but this time thinned down with some XW10 matte varnish, which I used previously, and some water. This is going to create a very thin version of the paint without it being watery. So this was airbrushed onto the various areas I thought that there would be sand accumulation and that's what I'm kind of going for here is a weathered sandy part of the tank. This was airbrushed onto the model from various angles mostly from below and to the sides to try and get sand look as though it's been accumulated during the operation of the tank in the desert. I'd also dry brush this exact same paint onto the model to further enhance the effect and give a little bit more variation, especially in the raised areas on the model, such as the panel lines, the rivets, etc. The final step on this video was to install an aerial. This aerial was simply a stretched piece of sprue, which I cut to the appropriate length and then glued into place on the model. When this had dried, I used some of the gunmetal paint from before to help blend it in and make it look a little bit more realistic. And with that, I'm calling my build of the M3 Stuart in 135 scale from Airfix complete. So there we have it. After nearly three years, I have finally finished my M3 Stuart. However, I'm hoping this isn't the end of the series, because if you remember, I've actually got some figures and I'd love to do a little diorama with it. So stay tuned and make sure you subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss when that one gets made. Hopefully it won't be in another three years. Thinking about this kit though, let's do a bit of a review. So on the whole, it's not a bad model. There isn't much in the way of flash and the details are quite good. However, I'm not entirely sure where I got my information from in previous videos and as I think I was under the impression that this was a more recent tooling than it actually is. So from what I can tell, this is actually a 2002 tooling from Academy, which has been reboxed. I know originally that I was under the impression that it was a Academy kit, but uh, I'm not entirely sure that I knew how old it was. But despite that fact, it's not a bad model for a 2002 tooling. You do get the option to use single link tracks if that's what you'd like, and I can imagine that they will go some way in helping this to look a little bit more realistic. The rubber band tracks I've used here, you can see they do curve in areas where they shouldn't necessarily curve due to the nature of what they're made out of. The instructions are pretty easy to follow, and I found the decal placement and painting instructions pretty good too. 
And whilst I did have my initial reservation about the quality of the transfers, they did apply to the model with absolutely no issues whatsoever. They may be a little bit thicker than normal, but there wasn't any silvering and I didn't experience any tears when they went on to the model, so that's a bonus in my book. Retailing for £26.99 here in the UK at the time this video was created, that doesn't seem to be a particularly bad price for what you're getting inside the box. However, it probably is worth remembering that there are other kits out there from other manufacturers of the same kind of scale that do come with a few extra bits and pieces, such as figures. I know I've got these figures and I want to do a little diorama with them a little bit later, but um, it would be nice if some came in the box with this kit. That being said though, there were quite a few parts in this kit which I haven't actually used, so I've got quite a lot of things to add to my spares box for now. As mentioned during the build, I'm not entirely sure I got the paints colours quite right on this, but I do quite like the way it looks in the end, and it's probably worth remembering that you do get two different paint schemes inside the box. You get the one that I've done here, but you also get one that is completely olive drab, so that may be a little bit easier to do if you were just starting out as a beginner. One small thing that may have been pointed out to me in my Discord server though is that the internal parts of the hatches may not have remained white and would have instead been painted the external colour. This isn't indicated in the instructions but it's something I wasn't aware of until after I'd finished the build. If I'm being brutally honest though, the only real issues that I encountered with this build were caused by past me. I'm not entirely sure what my aim was back two, three years ago when I did certain parts of it, and current me, having slightly different skills now, looks back and thinks, why did I do that? And then kind of have to try and fix my own mistakes or come up with a solution to rectify them. I guess at the time I knew exactly what I was doing, but now in retrospect, I'm not entirely sure I was making the right modeling decisions. I think though it's probably time to wrap this one up. Had I built this completely two or three years ago, I feel like it would have been more of a challenge, but now with my modeling skills at the stage they're at, I think I was able to overcome some of those difficulties with some reasonably good solutions. On the whole, this is a fairly fun little kit to build, and it does build into a fairly well detailed representation of the M3 Stuart. I'm looking forward to having a crack at putting this into a diorama. So don't forget that if you'd like to see that one, make sure you subscribe and turn notifications on so you never miss a modeling upload. Quick shout out to my patrons and channel members for the extra support they give the channel. Massive thanks to these guys on screen. And if you'd like to join them, take a look at the links in the description. I'd like to take this moment to welcome my newest members to the club. They are Dan Usher, Steve's Vintage Model Builds, War Uncovered, James Hall, Martin Roberts, Bantha Fodder, James and Stacy. Welcome to the club. There are other ways to help support this channel and again full information is available down in the description. I think the last thing to say though is a massive thank you to you for watching this one and I'll see you on the workbench again next time.